city. Namo into Retaya Gugulaya Pranayate. <laughs> Anyway, let's pray the internet stay alone. Okay, let's see. I'll participate. Okay, here we are. Oh, forget about me. There we go. All right, good to see everybody. Happy Saturday night, Sunday morning in this blessed material world, which is always full of surprises and miseries and whatever else this material world comes up with. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I was just talking to people today one of my god brothers very dear god brother in texas and i was explaining that i'm spending more time at meetings and on the computer than i've ever had in my whole life and people think that traveling is devastating on the body uh-uh it's actually more devastating to be seated behind a computer. I better get my right computer glasses out because to block the blue screen blocking glasses, there they are. All right. So it's more devastating. There we are, my nice blue blocking glasses. So it's more devastating to be sitting behind a computer all day long than it is to flying around the world where nobody can bother you when you're sitting in an airplane and just enjoying peace. You know, since this COVID thing has happened, it's just like practically 24 seven, you know, people are contacting me on the computer and there's absolutely no peace at all. I mean, my day started today at 5.30 in the morning with a conference. 5.30 to about eight o'clock in the morning, a little after eight with a conference, uh, dealing with, anyway, whatever. It was a GBC related conference dealing with uh, the legacy of Bhakti Chu Maharaj. And then it continued with the Vyasa Puja that I had to attend, not my own. Then it continued, uh, with counseling devotees. And now here we are again on the internet. And I don't, I think I'm gonna get some glasses with internet built in. So I just need to walk around and just like, I can go for morning walks. I can do anything and just see and talk to people wherever I am. Anyway, so much lamentation. Let's get on to the class. I need some sympathy here, some shoulders to cry over. So anyways, <laughs> let's chant Jai Radha Madhava. Jaya. How about that? Okay, Gopi Janabala Ba Giri Bharadhaluti Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana 
Yamunatira Vanachari Yamunatira Vanachari Jayavana Madhuva Punyabihari Jayurad O Madhava Punyabihari Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bharat Hati Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bharat Hati Vishoda Nandana Brajajan Naranjana Yashoda Nandana Brajajan Naranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Radha Kunjabi Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Paravidikacharya Otu Tera Satishi Shimad is Divine Grace of Ayah Chandana Bhakti Vedanta Goswami Shila Prabhupad Gijai Eskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupad Gijai Anantakoti Vaishnav Rindi Gijai Namacharya Shila Hila Stakur Gijai Param Sekaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Parabho Nityananda Shidwe Dagaratha Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindi Gijai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopi Gopin Hath Shyam Kun Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Kijai Vrindavanam Kijai Maturam Kijai Jagam Prasami Kijai Yamunamai Kijai Shimani Lassi Devi Gajai, Samaveda Bhakta Vrindi Gajai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Gaur. All glories, the assembled devotees, all glories, the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to she, Guru and Gauranga, Shila Prabhupada Gijai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhudale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamanit Namani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharani Nivashesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deja Tarane. So, Omaganata Miranda Shagananjana Shlakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shi Gurave Namaha. So I offer my respectful obeisances onto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Shila Bhopad, Shila Bhopad, Gijaya, so open my eyes, so kindly open my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So tomorrow night we're going to actually continue with our parikrama around Braj. So first we'll chant the prayers to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, one of the prayers written by Srinivas Acharya. Nana Shastra Vicharanaika Nipano Sadharma Samstapako Lokanam Hitaka Rene Rene Tri Bhuvane Vanyo Sharanya Karo Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Bhajana Nandena Maktali Kohu Vande Rupa Sanatano Ragu Yago Shri Jiva Gopala Kohu I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis, namely Sri Sanatana Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Shri Raghunath Das Goswami, Shri Jiva Goswami, and Shri Gopal Bhatta Goswami. Who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds and they are worth taking shelter of 
because they're absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So we're going to continue reading. Uh, right now we're talking about fraternal love in the nectar of devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So what is fraternal love? That means friendship. And actually, Srila Prabhupada said that our movement progresses because of this fraternal love between the devotees. This is the most prominent, sorry, prominent type of love that should be there between the devotees. And I'm not going to talk about conjugal love. Of course, the paternal love can also be there between the devotees, especially. If one's a spiritual master, uh, then one has to have a paternal affection for the disciple. And some disciples I have to be very paternal with because they are such rascals. Then I just have to tolerate so many things. Like a parent tolerates the kicking of their little kid. So that's paternal. And so, yes, you can have paternal relationships between the devotees in the movement. You can have fraternal relationships, and you can have servit servitude relationships. Forget about the other two. Okay, on that happy note, <laughs> I am going to continue reading Nectar Devotion about fraternal relationships. And we are in chapter 42 now. Progressing very, very quickly through the nectar of Rather quickly, there's not many pages left. Let's talk nectar devotion. We are on page, and I'm trying to see where the text ends. Actually, I'm not going to include the uh, index or the appendixes. So we are on page. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, 329 and 400 is the last page of the text in the Nectar of Devotion. So we don't have much further to go, and we'll see which book we're going to go to next. We will see. We'll take votes. Okay, no, we won't take votes, because I'm going to decide as the boss. So let's continue with Nectar of Devotion about fraternal loving affairs. This is chapter 42. All right. Here we go. And if the internet freezes, someone send me a message. I mean, if it freezes for more than two seconds, because I won't be able to see as I'm reading. So, chapter 42, Fraternal Loving Affairs. Krishna's age, his beauty, his bugle, his flute, his conch shell, and his pleasing attitude all provoke love and friendship for him. Remember, that's vibhava, the things that provoke, stimulate love, ecstasy. His exceptional joking activities, abilities, sorry, sorry, exhibited sometimes by his pretending to be a royal prince or even the supreme personality of Godhead. Also give impetus to devotees, developing love for Krishna and friendship. This is really interesting. Exceptional joking abilities exhibited sometimes by his pretending to be a royal prince. This, of course, is in Vrindavan. Or even pretends to be the supreme personality of God. And listen to that. Also give impetus to devotees developing love for Krishna and friendship. That's interesting. In Vrindavan, sometimes he pretends to be God. Learned scholars have divided Krishna's age into three periods. The age of do through five years is called Kovara. The age from the sixth through tenth year is called Boganda. And the age from the eleventh through fifteenth year is called Kaishora. While Krishna is spending his days as a coward boy, he is in the Komara and Poganda ages in the Kaishora age. When Krishna appeared in Gokula, he acted as a coward boy, and then when he was sixteen, he went to Mathura to kill Kangsa. So there's the statement. Some acharyas will say he went to Mathura when he was 12. And Srila Prabhupada and obviously Srila Rupa Goswami say 
that he went to Mathura when he was 16. The way that some Acharyas reconcile that is they say Krishna grew up really quickly. But that's not what Srila Prabhupada taught us. Uh, Prabhupada taught us that, you know, it's 16. Uh, that means he finished his 15th year. That means 16. You understand? Finished his 16th year. Another thing about birthdays is quite interesting. When you're 15 years old, it's your 16th birthday, according to the Indian culture. Why is that? You're 15 years old. It's your 16th birthday because you count the day you were born as your birthday. Huh? That's a no-brainer. That's actually very intelligent. <laughs> so I just uh, had my, oh my God, then I would just celebrate my 72nd birthday and I'm 71 years old. Actually makes me older. The Kamara age is just suitable for reciprocating the love of a child with Mother Yashoda, obviously. I mean, after five, obviously, that's when you're a little, cute little baby. Krishna was cute all the time, though. In the 10th canto, 13th chapter, verse 11 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami tells King Pariksit, My dear King, although Lord Krishna is the supreme enjoyer and the beneficiary of all kinds of sacrificial ceremonies, he still used to eat with his coward boyfriends. This is because at that time he accepted the pastimes of an ordinary boy, keeping his flute under his arm and his bugle on the right side of his, in his belt, along with his cane. In his left hand he would hold a lump of rice paste with yogurt, and in his fingers would be Pilu, the king of fruits. Wow. Actually, there are still some Pilu trees. It's interesting. Pilu is the king of fruits. That is so interesting. Sometimes Prabhupada would say mango is the king of fruits. Here, Rupa Goswami is saying that Pilu is the king of fruits. Actually, if you don't know how to eat a Pilu properly, you will burn your throat. And that was brought out in the story in the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, where the devotees brought back from Braj some Pilu fruits to the devotees in Jagannath Puri, and they ate it, and the, the seed was like a hot pepper or something like that. When he would thus sit among his friends, it would appear that he was the whirl of a lotus flower, and that his friends surrounding him themselves, the denizens of heaven, would the scene. So another thing that's described about Krishna eating with his friends in a circle like this is that each and every one of them thought Krishna was looking at them. And that means unlimited friends, and Krishna was looking at all of them simultaneously. Internet's getting choppy. Uh, let me know if it gets too choppy, and then I have to go on my phone. Whoops, too choppy. Not that bad yet. If it gets unacceptable, then I'll use my phone, but then I have to, then it uses up the internet data on the phone. Okay. As soon as it gets unacceptable. How, how, hopefully we're going to get a new internet modem tomorrow, and that'll solve the problem. So Krishna's Poganda age can be further divided into three periods, namely the beginning, middle, and end. That's easy. In the beginning of the Poganda age, there's a very nice reddish luster on his lips. Uh oh, another chat. That was just a normal two line outs, two time outs. Oh, just a normal thing. In the beginning of the Poganda age, there is a very nice reddish luster on his lips. His abdomen is very thin, and on his neck are circles like those of a concho. Sometimes some outside visitors would return to Vrindavan to see Krishna and upon seeing him again, would exclaim, My dear Mukunda, your beauty is gradually increasing, just like the leaf on a banyan tree. My dear lotus-eyed one, your neck is gradually manifesting circles like those of a conch shell. And in the shining moonlight, your teeth and cheeks are competing with the Padmagraga jewels in their beautiful arrangements. I am sure that your beautiful bodily development is now giving much pleasure to your friends. At this age, Krishna was garlanded with various kinds of flowers. He used to put on a silk dress colored with various kinds of dye. Such beautiful decorations are considered cosmetics for Krishna. 
Krishna would wear this dress when he used to go into the forest and tend the cows. Sometimes he would wrestle there with his different friends, and sometimes they would dance all together in the forest. These are some of the specific activities of the Pogonda age. Hmm. And actually, when Krishna went into the forest, he would not wear shoes or any covering on his feet. And the reason for that is that Krishna said he did not want to be better than the cows who didn't have shoes. And therefore, the reason, another internal reason Krishna didn't wear shoes is because he wanted people to be in anxiety that his feet would get hurt. Especially the gopis, they were in anxiety, thinking that his feet were hurt when they put his feet over their breasts. And therefore, they were thinking, oh, Krishna must be really in pain. So this drew them closer to Krishna, their anxiety. Anxiety for Krishna brings one closer to Krishna. The coward friends of Krishna were so happy in his company that they expressed their transcendental feelings within themselves. Thus, my dear Krishna, you're always busy tending the cows, which are scattered all over beautiful Vrindavana. You have a beautiful garland, a small conch shell, a peacock feather in your turban, a yellow-colored silk cloth decorations of carnicata flowers in your ears, and a malika flower garland on your chest. Appearing so beautiful, when you pretend, just like an actor, to be fighting with us, you give us unlimited transcendental bliss. When Krishna has more grown up in the middle age of Boganda, remember, Boganda has three ages, beginning, middle, end. His nails become finely sharp and his chubby cheeks <laughs> become lustrous and round. On the two sides of his waist above his belt, there are three distinct lines of folded skin called chavalai. The coward boyfriends of Krishna felt very proud of their association with him. At that time, the tip of his nose defeated the beauty of sesame flowers, the luster of his cheeks defeated the glow of pearls, and the two sides of his body were exquisitely beautiful. In this age, Krishna wore a silk dress that glittered like lightning. His head was decorated with a silk turban covered with gold lace, and in his hand he carried a stick about 56 inches long. Wow, it's long. Seeing this exquisitely beautiful dress of Krishna, one devotee addressed his friend in this manner. My dear friend, just look at Krishna. See how he is carrying in his hand a stick which is bound up and down with golden rings, how his turban with golden lace is showing such a beautiful luster, and how his dress is giving his friends the highest transcendental pleasure. At the end of Krishna's Pogoda age, Krishna's hair sometimes hangs down to his hips and sometimes becomes scattered. In this age, his two shoulders become higher and broader, and his face is always decorated with marks of tilak. When his beautiful hair scatters over his shoulders, it appeared, appears to be the goddess of fortune embracing him, and this embracing is highly relished by his friends. Subal once addressed the lotus flower in your hand, the vertical marks of tilak on your and all your are defeating me today. Although I am usually stronger than you or any of our friends, since this is so, I do not know how these features of your body can fail to defeat the pride of all the young girls of Vrindavana. Hmm. When I am so defeated by this beauty, what chance is there for those who are naturally very simple and flexible? Let me just, I was just reminded when I was hearing about Krishna's dress about a message I need to send. It will just take me one second about how I didn't like Radharani's hair this morning it just reminded me of that so I need uh, let me just send a message to our head Pujari okay back to with your devotion so one thing I wanted to mention is that Krishna's undergoing all these external different manifestations of his transcendental body. His body's actually not changing, but the external appearance or manifestation is changing. Although Krishna's body 
is not like our body that changes as we get older. And the proof of that is that he never gets more than 16. Our bodies may manifest something similar. Of course, they're full of blood and guts, uh, bile, mucus, and air, which Krishna's body has no veins in it even, as Shnabi Ram. Uh, but our bodies get older and older and older. And after 16, it's all downhill. Believe me, it's really downhill. And the older you get, the steeper the downhill stuff gets until you hit bottom. And that's called D-E-A-T-H. So, anyway, on that happy note, let's continue. At this age, Krishna took pleasure whispering into the ears of his friends. And the subject of his talks was the beauty of the gopis, who were just tarrying before them. So Baal once addressed Krishna that are very cunning. You can understand the thoughts of others, and therefore I am whispering them within your ear that all of these five gopis who are most beautiful have been attracted by your dress. Suval, of course, is the most confidential devotee, not just intimate, most confidential. And I believe that Cupid has entrusted them with the responsibility of conquering you. In other words, the beauty of the gopis was capable of conquering Krishna, although Krishna is the conqueror of all universes. And the beauty of the gopis is not mundane. Their beauty is a manifestation of love of Krishna. It's not like the beauty of girls in this world. It's a manifestation of pus and mucus and blood. Sorry if I've offended any of you attractive young ladies. But the beauty in it's a fact. It's a fact. When Krishna and the gopis put on things like decorations, makeup, earrings, nose rings, they make those accoutrements more beautiful. It's not that the accoutrements make them more beautiful. You understand? They make their jewelry more beautiful by being associated with them. In the material world, uh, the jewelry that people put on make people, I wouldn't say more beautiful, but make them at least like not so repulsive. <laughs> anyway, don't let me get into it. Just like, I mean, just like here in class, I am using uh, lights. As many of you may know, I'm using lights of different colors. So I adjust the color of the lights so that I look half decent on the screen. You know, so it's like half nice. And if I don't have the right color, then it doesn't look so good. So the symptoms of the Kaishore age, now we got that up to 16, you know, the end of the 15th age, have already been described, and it is this age that the devotees generally most appreciate Krishna. Krishna with Radha. Radharani, is worshipped as Kishore Kishore. And actually, there's deities in Chicago that I help with the installation of, and uh, they're called Kishore Kishore. Actually, the uh, Chicago deities, they were the first Radha Krishna deities that I personally worshipped many, many years ago. Anyway, the temple was in a place called Evanston, Illinois. Krishna does not increase his age. Sankri said that although he's the oldest person out, form is always youthful. In the pictures of Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, we can see that he is youthful, although at that time he was old enough to have sons, grandsons, and great grandsons. The coward boyfriends of Krishna once said, Dear Krishna, you need not decorate your body with so many ornaments. Your transcendental features are themselves so beautiful, you do not require any ornamentation. At this age, whenever Krishna begins to vibrate his flute early in the morning, all of his friends immediately get up from bed just to join him in going to the pasturing grounds. One of the friends once said, My dear coward friends, the sound of Krishna's flute from above Govardhan Hill is telling us that we need not go to search him out on the bank of the Yamuna. Parvati, 
The wife of Lord Shiva told her husband, my dear Panchamukha, which means five-faced, just look at the Pandavas. After hearing the sound of Krishna's conch shell, known as Panchajanya, they have regained their strength and are just like lions. At this age, Krishna once dressed himself up exactly like Radharani just to create fun among his friends. He put on golden earrings, and because he was blackish, he smeared the pulp of kumkum all over his body in order to become as fair as she. By seeing this dress, Krishna's friend Suval, Krishna's friend Suval, sorry about that, that was my phone exhibiting ecstatic symptoms. Krishna's friend Zabal became very astonished. Krishna played with his intimate friends, sometimes by fighting or wrestling with their arms, sometimes by playing ball, and sometimes by playing chess. Sometimes they carried one another on their shoulders, and sometimes they exhibited their expertness at whirling logs. And the coward friends used to please Krishna by sitting together with him on couches or in swings, by lying together on their beds, by joking together, and by swimming in the pool. All these activities are called anubhava. Remember what I said about anubhava? These are voluntary activities, voluntary emotions that they choose to do. The other types of emotions are not really chosen. They choose to dance. They choose to swim in the pool. They choose to go on the swings with Krishna. They choose to joke with Krishna. Whenever all the friends would assemble in the company of Krishna, they would immediately engage in all these functions, especially in dancing together. Regarding their wrestling, one friend once asked Krishna, my dear friend, O killer of the god demon, you are very proudly wandering among your friends trying to exhibit your arms as very strong. Is it that you are envious of me? I know that you cannot defeat me in wrestling, and I also know that you were sitting idly for a long time because you were hopeless of defeating me. Phew, that's chivalry. That's indirect Russell chivalry, which we'll talk about in the future. All the friends were very daring and would risk any difficulty because they were confident that Krishna would help them to be victorious in all adventures. They used to sit together and advise one another what to do, sometimes inducing one another to be engaged in welfare work. Sometimes, they would offer betel nuts to one another, decorate one another's faces with tilak or smear pulp of chandan on one another's bodies. Sometimes, for the sake of amusement, they used to decorate their faces in strange ways. Another business of their friends was that each of them wanted to defeat Krishna. Sometimes they used to snatch his clothing or snatch away the flowers from his hands. Sometimes, one would try to induce another to decorate his body for him. And failing this, they were always ready to fight, challenging one another to combat in wrestling. These were some of the general activities of Krishna and his friends. Sounds like so much fun. Another important pastime of the friends of Krishna was that they served as messengers to and from the gopis. He's the confidential, most confidential uh, friends. They introduced the gopis to Krishna and canvassed for Krishna. When the gopis were in disagreement with Krishna, these friends would support Krishna's side in his presence. But when Krishna was not present, they would support the side of the gopis. In this way, sometimes supporting one side, sometimes the other, they would talk very privately with much whispering in the ears, although none of the business was very serious. <laughs> so much fun. Actually, you should get up to the higher rasas, it gets more and more fun. The servants of Krishna were sometimes engaged in collecting flowers, decorating his body with valuable ornaments and trinkets, dancing before him, singing, helping him herd the cows, massaging his body, preparing flower garlands, and sometimes fanning his body. These were some of the primary duties of the servants of Krishna. The friends and servants of Krishna were combined together in serving them, and all their activities are known as Anubhava. Anubhava means something that follows your stimulation that you decide to do. Okay, got it. When Krishna came out from the Yamuna after chastising the Kaliya Nag, I mean, did not raise his arms because of his great When Krishna used to play on his flute, the vibration appeared just like the roaring of clouds in the sky during the constellation of Swati. 
according to Vedic astronomical calculation. If there is rain during the constellation of the Svati star, any rain falling on the sea will produce pearls. Wow. You've got to get me an astrologer. And the rain falling on the serpent will produce jewels. Wow. Similarly, when Krishna's flute roared like a thunder cloud under the Swati constellation, the resulting perspiration on Sridhama's body appeared to be just like pearls. When Krishna and Subal were embracing one another, Shimati Radharani became a little envious and hiding her hot temperament. She said, My dear Subal, you are very fortunate because even in the presence of superiors, you and Krishna have no hesitation in putting your arms on each other's shoulders. I think it must be admitted that in your previous lives you have succeeded in many kinds of austerities. The idea is that although Radharani was accustomed to putting her arms on Krishna's shoulders, it was not possible for her to do such a thing in the presence of her superiors, whereas Subal could do so freely. Radharani therefore praised his good fortune. When Krishna entered the lake of Kaliya, his intimate friends became so perturbed that their bodily colors faded and they all produced horrible, gurgling sounds. At that time, all of them fell down on the ground as if unconscious. Similarly, when there was a forest fire, all of Krishna's friends neglected their own protection and surrounded Krishna on all sides to protect him from the flames. This behavior of the friends toward Krishna is described by thoughtful poets as Vyabhachari. So Vyabhachari means they can't control, it just happens. And it's intermittent. In Vyabhachari ecstatic love for Krishna, there is sometimes madness, dexterity, fear, laziness, jubilation, pride, dizziness, meditation, disease forgetfulness and humbleness. In other words, it just like comes upon someone, they can't control it coming, and it goes when it's supposed to go, and you can't predict when it's going to come. These are some of the common symptoms on the stage of Vyabhachari, ecstasy, ecstatic love for Krishna. When there are dealings between Krishna and his friends, which are completely devoid of any feelings of respect, and they all treat one another on equal levels, such ecstatic love and friendship is called Stai and steady. When one is situated in this confidential, friendly relationship with Krishna, one shows symptoms of love such as attraction, affinity, affection, and attachment. An example of stai was exhibited when Arjuna told Akrura, My dear son of a Gandhani, please ask Krishna when I shall be able to embrace him in my arms. When there is full knowledge of Krishna's superiority, and yet in dealings with him on friendly terms, respectfulness is completely absent. That stage is called affection. There's one brilliant example of this affection. When the demigods headed by Lord Shiva were offering respectful prayers to Krishna, describing the glorious opulences of the Lord, Arjuna stood before him with his hand on his shoulders and brushed the dust from his peacock feather. So in other words, Arjuna is actually equal to Krishna in age, so they're equal friends. But sometimes he sees an exhibition of Krishna's godly nature. And even when he sees an exhibition of Krishna's godly nature, because the demigods are offering Krishna prayers, he still doesn't put aside his friendly attitude. But sometimes... ...loving chapter of the Gita. When the Pandavas were banished by Duryodhana and forced to live incognito in the forest, no one could
fan out. Uh, How about now? Can everybody hear me? Someone send me a message. Okay, now I'm on my phone internet, so there shouldn't be a problem. So, unfortunately, let me just continue. Let me just look here and see everybody. Yeah, yeah, the internet's good now. Let me go back to sharing the screen. Sorry about that. This is terrible. Okay, let's continue. So let me just go back a little bit so you don't miss anything. When the Pandavas were banished by Duryodhana and forced to live incognito in the forest, no one could trace out where they were staying at that time, the great sage Narada met Lord Krishna and said, My dear Mukunda, although you were the supreme personality of Godhead, the all-powerful person, by making friendship with you, the Pandavas have become bereft of their legitimate right to the kingdom of the world, and moreover, they are now living in the forest incognito. Sometimes they must work as ordinary laborers in someone's house. These symptoms appear to be very inauspicious materially, uh, but the beauty is that the Pandavas have not lost their faith and love for you in spite of all these tribulations. In fact, they are always thinking of you and chanting your name in ecstatic friendship. There's such nectar this part of the uh, nectar devotion. Another example of acute affection for Krishna is given in the 10th canto, 15th chapter, verse 18 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. In the pasturing ground, Krishna felt a little tired and wanted to take rest, so he lay down on the ground. At that time, many coward boys assembled there and with great affection began to sing suitable songs so that Krishna would rest very nicely. There's a nice example of the friendship between Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. When the fighting was going on, Aswatthama, the son of Dronacharya, unceremoniously attacked Krishna. Although according to the prevailing rules of chivalry, one's chariot driver should never be attacked by the enemy. Ashwatthama behaved heinously in so many ways that he did not hesitate to attack Krishna's body, although Krishna was acting only as a charioteer for Arjuna. When Arjuna saw that Ashwatthama was releasing various kinds of arrows to hurt Krishna, he immediately stood in front of Krishna to intercept all of them. At that time, although Arjuna was being harmed by those arrows, he felt an ecstatic love for Krishna, and the arrows appeared to him to be like shower, showers of flowers. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, there's complete ecstasy reading this part of the active devotion. There's another instance of ecstatic love for Krishna and friendship. Once when a coward boy named Vrishabha was collecting flowers from the forest to prepare a garland to be offered to Krishna, the sun reached its zenith, and although the sunshine was scorching hot, Vrishabha felt it to be like moonshine. That is the way of rendering transcendent loving service to the Lord. When devotees are put into great difficulties, even like the Pandavas, as described above, they feel all their miserable conditions to be great facilities for serving the Lord. Wow. I'll read that again. When devotees are put into great difficulties, even like the Pandavas as described above, they feel all their miserable conditions 
to be great facilities for serving the Lord. Wow. Another instance of Arjuna's friendship with Krishna was described by Narada, who reminded Krishna, when Arjuna was learning the art of shooting arrows, he could not see you for so many days. But when you arrived there, he stopped all of his activities and immediately embraced you. This means that even though Arjuna was engaged in learning about the military art, he had not forgotten Krishna for a moment. And as soon as there was an opportunity to see Krishna, Arjuna immediately embraced him. One servant of Krishna named Bhaktri once addressed him like this, My dear Lord, you protected the coward boys from the hunger of the Gosura demon, and you protected them from the poisonous effects of the Kaliya snake. And you also saved them from the fierce forest fire. But I am suffering from your separation, which is more severe than the hunger of Agasura, the poison of Lake Kaliya, and the burning of the forest fire. So why should you not protect me from the pangs of separation? Another friend once told Krishna, my dear enemy of Kangsa, since you have left us, the heat of separation has become extraordinary. And this heat is felt more severely when we understand that in Bandiravana, you are being refreshed by the waves of the cooling river known as Banu Tuniya, that is Radharani. The purport is that when Krishna was engaged with Radharani, the coward boys headed by Subal were feeling great separation, and that was unbearable for them. Another friend addressed Krishna thus. Let me just see how much more we have to read in this particular chapter. Uh, oh, not much. Uh, the chapter today. Another friend addressed Krishna thus, My dear Krishna, O killer of Agasura, when you left Vrindavan to kill King Kongs and Mathura, all the coward boys became bereft of the four, their four bhutas, that means the elements earth, water, fire, space. Anyway. And the fifth Buddha, the air, was flowing very rapidly within their nostrils. That answers my question. When Krishna went to Mathura to kill King Kangsa, all the coward boys became so afflicted by the separation that they almost died. When a person is dead, it is said that he has given up the five elements known as Buddhas as the body again mixes with the five elements from which it was prepared. In this case, although the four elements, earth, water, Fire and ether were already gone. The remaining element, air, was still very prominent. It was blowing through their nostrils furiously. In other words, after Krishna left Vrindavan, the coward boys were always anxious about what would happen in his fight with King Kongsa. One more paragraph, I think. Another friend once informed Krishna, when one of your friends was feeling much separation from you, there were tears covering his lotus eyes. And so the black drones of sleep became discouraged from entering his eyes and left that place. When there is a lotus flower, the black drones fly into it to collect honey. The eyes of Krishna's friend are compared to the lotus flower and because they were full of tears. The black drones of sleep could not collect honey from his lotus eyes and therefore left the place. In other words, because he was too much afflicted, his eyes were full of tears and he could not sleep. This is an example of staying up at night because of separation from Krishna. Whew. Wow, these are really intense points here. Let me just mark this. Staying up at night because of... Okay, got it. Okay, so let's take some questions now. Sorry about the internet problems. It ain't my fault. So, uh, wait a second. Uh, 
So who wants to ask a question now? Not many people left online. Only 23. Who wants to ask a question? Questions? Comments? Problems? Issues? Kurt Dave? Yes, go Paul Cohen. Uh, earlier, you, uh, in the beginning of the class, you talked about um, different rasas between devotees. And you talked yeah. about paternal and paternal. And that you um, you have a relationship with some di disciples specifically that you have to um, parent them. Yeah. So tell me. So if you consider that all living entities are part and parcel of Krishna, are you feeling some sort of actual um, paternal rasa or or parenthood rasa with Krishna when? You're engaging uh, activities with disciples? No, that's a service. That's out of service. You manifest a particular relationship. It's not with Krishna. With Krishna is a different thing. I'm just talking about in this world that the spiritual master is the father of the disciple. In the spiritual world, the spiritual master may be one of the coward boys of the disciple. Or the spiritual master may be one of the gopis. The spiritual master may be the tree, and the disciple is picking fruit from the tree to offer in Radha, to Radha and Krishna. Anyway, don't equate what's happening in this world or the different relationships we have with uh, what's happening in the spiritual world. We say that the spiritual master is the eternal father. Yes, I understand that. But that means also that the relationship in the spiritual world will not be the same like fatherly like we have in the material world but the spiritual master will be engaging the disciple uh in krishna radha and krishna's service in the spiritual world and that way it's taking like a fatherly mm, let's say service but maybe not a fatherly bhav you understand the difference so don't worry. Maybe one day. Don't worry. When we go back to the spiritual world, if you were there, and when we go back to the spiritual world, I won't have to babysit anymore. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, to that point. <laughs> Thank you. Unless my relationship is with Krishna, then I can babysit for Krishna. So maybe I'm getting trained up in that way. So anyway, so... I'm just joking. It has nothing to do with my relationship in the spiritual world. So, who else has a question? Question or comment? Hopefully tomorrow the internet will be better. We've been having all sorts of trouble with the internet lately. And we don't know what it is exactly. So, someone else must have a question. Or a comment. Yes, yes. Oh. That's shocking. Sita, you have a question? Um, yes, Kumar. It's not related to um, today's class. Um, but sometimes when we go to devotees' place, um, we have darshan of the deities. And um, sometimes we don't see a smiling face of deities. You know, it just seems that they are not happy or sad. Um, just trying to understand, are we in that position to be able to judge or? Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes we misjudge. Like, we, like devotees, they look at a picture of Prabhupada and said to Prabhupada one time, you look pretty sad in this picture. And Prabhupada said, I was exhibiting the greatest ecstasy. <laughs> but maybe the deities are happy and just experiencing Maybe they're just experiencing separation from each other or separation from a particular devotee. It's, we shouldn't project our material understanding. I mean, sometimes, I'll give you a practical example in my own life. I'm not going to say pastimes. Once upon a time, I went to a temple that was really a mess. I was asked to go there. It was in South America. I was asked to go there to help straighten them up. 
I mean, it was a complete disaster, this temple. And I went before the deities, Radha and Krishna, and Krishna actually looked like Lord Nishingadev. I looked at Krishna, I looked at Radharani, he looked like, uh oh, Ugra Nishinga and Ugra Nishinga, his wife. And it was scary. So, but in that case, I could, know, I could find, figure out through objective uh, evidence that Krishna was not happy. But we should be careful to not project our own misunderstanding or our own understandings upon the realm of the absolute. Like sometimes we see like a devotee, like they're miserable, but they may be experiencing the greatest ecstasy. You know, because we, we generally, uh, generally uh, look at certain facial, certain person's facial expressions and come to certain conclusions based upon how we would feel if we were making those particular facial expressions. And it doesn't always hold, so we have to be careful. Don't. Don't jump to conclusions when you go to someone's house and say, yeah, Krishna's miserable in your house, and you must be very bad devotee because Krishna's so miserable in your house. In my house, Krishna's smiling. In your house, Krishna's angry. So, so be careful, all right? Be careful. Yes, <laughs> thank you. All right, any other questions? We've lost a lot of people tonight because we Oops. Any other questions from anybody in our gallery here? This is your opportunity. Opportunity to ask questions. And if you don't, then we can end a little early. I'm not that early. It's actually two minutes to the hour. Okay. So tomorrow is Sunday here and Monday for those of you in Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. So we're probably going to do a Sunday, something a little bit different on Sunday like we usually do. It's actually a special day tomorrow. It's Gopashtami, Radha Das Goswami's uh, uh, disappearance, and I believe it's Srinivas Acharya's disappearance. Let me just see. I believe so. Let me put my. Krishna Consciousness classes on. Uh, the 22nd. Dhananjaya Pandit's disappearance, Srinivas Acharya's disappearance. So we may speak about them, or we may do a parikrama like we normally do on Sundays during the month of uh, Kartik around Braj. Probably continue our Braj Mando parikrama, which is a lot of fun, and speak briefly about Srinivas Acharya. Okay, so thank you all very much for joining us, and sorry for the internet glitches. All glorious to his divine grace. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shiva Prabhupada, nectar devotion to the ecstatic remembrance of Krishna's boyhood pastimes today. Good evil.